ask you to stand. And you don't need to open your Bibles because um, we're going to be going through a couple of passages. I'm going to ask you to look to the screens if you would. And um, I'll read the odd-numbered verses if you would join in reading uh, the even-numbered verses. We'll go through three passages to set up today in a message that we are entitling, themed, Come Back California. What does that mean? I guess I should go over here. Come back California, what could that mean? Well, why is that in Latin over here regarding glory to God alone? What's that all about? We're merging a couple of things. We're merging the fact that California was first visited by the gospel uh, in Latin by Father Sarah back in the late 1700s, 1770s, 1777, and he planted 21 uh, missions up and down the state of California to propagate the gospel to the natives. The gospel was introduced to the west coast of the United States at the same time the colonial fathers were establishing a revolution on the east coast. Two things happening on both sides of this continent. When we talk about come back California, that's what you're going to hear about today. California needs to come back to its origin, and its origin is to come back to God very, very clearly, to come back to its original founding to God. We'll start 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I'll begin if you would read verse 2. Therefore, I exult first of all that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Now we go to Matthew 5, verse 13. I'll begin verse 13 if you'd follow along. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under the foot by men. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And then one final verse, and I'll read it out louder. Let's just do it together. It's one verse. Second Chronicles 7.14. Ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. If my people my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Father, we praise you, Lord, and we ask you, God, in Jesus' name, that you would do just that. Lord, to your glory, may you reclaim California. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You can be seated, church. And uh, to set the stage, to set the mood for this morning and the dynamic of what's going on, I want to publicly, first of all, challenge all of you to literally use your skills that God has given you to be discerning and to be wise. A lot of people are caught up in an emotional fervor over the events of the last week or so. And emotion is driving the day among the lives of some. Let's remember that the culmination of yesterday and national history being made is the fact that never before in the history of the United States of America for any office, including the president, including the CIA, including the FBI and the NSA, has one individual been examined, scrutinized, with a forensic background study and investigation, not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, not five times, not six times, seven times, more than any other American citizen in human history, and whatever accusations were levied against him were proven to be completely false. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to know that... Yesterday at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon Eastern Time, the shift of the United States Supreme Court shifted pro-life, 
pro-family, pro-America. And that shouldn't surprise any of us. We learned from then-President John Adams, quote, the general principles on which the fathers, that's the Pilgrim Fathers, achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity, said Adams. I will avow, I then believed and now believe that those general principles of Christianity are as eternal and immutable, that is unchanging, as the existence and the attributes of God. John Adams also said on June In 1776, in his writings, Thoughts on Government, quote, it is the duty of all men in society publicly and at stated seasons to worship the supreme being, the the great creator and preserver of the universe, and no subject shall be hurt, molested, restrained in his person, liberty, or estate for worshiping God in the manner most agreeable to the dictates of his own conscience or for his religious profession or sentiments, provided he doth not disturb the public peace or obstruct others in their religious worship. John Adams again said, quote, Suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible for their only law book, and every member should regulate his conduct by the precepts there exhibited. What a utopia, what a paradise, or would this region be? Those were the opinions of John Adams, but he wasn't alone, by no means. This next picture I want to show you in setting up today is quite, to me, inspiring. Because a man uh, from England adopted, when he heard about the criticism, his own king in England began to mock and ridicule the Black Robe Regiment. In fact, it was King George III in England prior to the revolutionary period that saw the rise of liberty and freedom in the hearts of his colonialists, his subjects, loyal subjects in America, that they began to burn within them regarding the concept of liberty. And all critics agree that that concept came from the pulpits, and King George said that it's coming from those of the Black Robe Regiment. There's the, there's the militia, the armed militia of America, and then there's others that are in the pulpit, and they're armed with the Bible, and he called them the Black Robe Regiment. It was a, a derogatory term, but it so caught the heart of a guy by the name of George Whitfield. Have you ever heard about him? George Whitfield, that he started to come to America. In fact, he spent just about as much time in America as he did in England preaching, and George Whitfield fell in love with freedom. And he prided himself in being one of those preachers. And there he is donning his black robe. He was so short, he would stand upon an altar or barrels uh, laid one upon another that he might preach to the crowds. In one moment, uh, at Harvard University, it was said that Ben Franklin estimated that there was some 35,000 people listening to George Whitfield preach. By the way, there was one particular founding father that so believed in what Whitfield was doing that he actually funded George Whitfield's crusades in the United States or the colonies. Do you guys know who that is? Say it again. Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin pulled out his checkbook, as it were, and funded the ministry ventures of George Whitfield. Remarkable. What did they preach about? What did they say? Yes, they gave the gospel, which, by the way, if you're a stranger here today, let's give it, right? The Bible says that Jesus Christ is God in human skin, that he came from heaven to earth. He lived a perfect life because the Bible says he was born of a virgin, and he himself, being God manifested in human flesh, died on the cross for the sins of all mankind. The Bible says because death could not hold him down because he was sinless, that on the third day, Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures, rose again from the dead. And Jesus Christ, after the culmination of his earthly ministry, the Bible says, ascended back to heaven. He died for your sins and mine, and there's no salvation apart from Jesus. That's what Whitfield preached. That's what every faithful pulpit in America preached. And that's what every pulpit in America ought to be preaching today. That there's salvation in Jesus and him alone. But beyond that, what did they preach? What did they say? Let's put the first sermon up. This should not surprise us. First sermon. We see a sermon here. Notice this, a sermon. 
of the colonial period, a sermon preached before His Excellency John Hancock. So John Hancock is obviously uh, going to be in the audience that day of the church. And notice what it's about. I find this uh, to be fascinating. Uh, this is a sermon preached by Jonas Clark, a remarkable patriot, a remarkable soldier, a remarkable pastor. And what was he preaching? He was preaching a message on the election. On the election. Next slide. What do they preach? Here's a discourse from the book of Revelation. And it's on the occasion by the earthquakes in November 1755. The pastor, which by the way, I love this man, Jonathan Mayhew. I mean, I never met him. I'm going to meet him later in heaven. But I've read about him. I feel like I know him. John, Jonathan Mayhew uh, was one of those black robe regiment pastors. And um, he was so instrumental in creating the atmosphere of the defense of liberty and freedom that King George III e issued an edict that if you find, if any one of the uh, British subjects or the British uh, military finds Jonathan Mayhew without trial, he's to be hung before the sun is set on that day. Why? Because he preached liberty and faithfulness to God and not an Im imposing government. And King George III considered him a traitor to the crown of England. Next slide. What do they preach? A discourse on the good news from a far country delivered July 24th. And on the day of thanksgiving to Almighty God, this message was preached by the great preacher Charles Chauncey. And he preached it from the first church in Boston. And this is remarkable. What did he preach on? He preached out of the Bible regarding the repeal of the Stamp Act. He talked about Pharaoh and he talked about the Egyptians being taxed and labored to their, almost to their destruction. They took, listen church, they took issues of the day and they took their biblical worldview and they immediately put them together because that's how you live your Bible. That's how you live your life. Your Bible's not some old book. It's the book of the future. It's the book of today. The Bible has the answers for your life. What else did they preach? What else do we see this? Here's a sermon on judgment and, and on righteousness. Look at this. The ungodly con uh, condemned in judgment a sermon preached at Springfield, December 13th, 1770, by Moses Baldwin. And what was it about? On the occasion of the execution of William Shaw for murder. And there the scripture references given in Genesis chapter six or chapter nine, verse six, regarding from the Bible, if you shed someone's blood by by others, your blood will be shed. You see how they brought the culture together in the Bible? And this is just one of tens of thousands of sermons preached. That's very, very important that we all understand that. Before we go any further today, I want to set up this morning by laying this out before you. Our nation now had won its liberty and its freedom from England, but we were struggling to form a government. We were not making any headway at all. On July 28, 1787, Benjamin Franklin declared a request for prayer. And I read this request, quote, in this situation of this assembly, groping as it were in the dark to find political truth, and scarce able to distinguish it when presented to us, how has it happened, sir, that we have not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to illuminate our understandings? In the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible or sensible of our danger, we had daily prayer in this room for the, the divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. All of us who are engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of superintending providence. It's another reference to God in our favor. I have lived, sir, a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? When Franklin was done with that, they got up and they went across the street and they prayed for hours. And that prayer meeting, by the way, is recorded in our National Archive. But my question to you this morning is, church, if Franklin's request for prayer is viable, and if his comment regarding 
that God governs in the affairs of men, then I have this question for you. How? How does God govern in the affairs of men? Because Franklin's statement is certainly a biblical truth. How does it happen? This is how it happens. I'm going to show you this next slide. Reminding you of the state that you're sitting in. This is the preamble to the Constitution of the state of California. That Constitution opens with this at the very top. We, the people of the state of California, grateful to Almighty God for our freedom in order to secure and perpetuate its blessings, do establish this Constitution. It wasn't only the fact that California was founded by preaching the gospel by the ventures of Father Sarah in those 21 missions. But when our government was coming together as a state, they looked to God and they prayed and they sought God. And finally, one more reminder. A man was running for office. He was known in Hollywood. He was known on the silver screen. But his rise to power was just beginning. And I'm curious if you'll recognize his voice. Our founding fathers here in this country brought about the only true revolution that has ever taken place in man's history. Every other revolution simply exchanged one set of rulers for another set of rulers. But only here did that little band of men so advanced beyond their time that the world has never seen their like since evolve the idea that you and I have within ourselves the God-given right and the ability to determine our own destiny. But freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Thank you. Well, I have to tell you, um, California, in my opinion, I was born and raised, uh, born in San Diego and then moved up uh, in Orange County. I grew up in a home that was, was known as a Reagan home, Ronald Reagan. Uh, I did not have a religious home growing up in, but uh, I knew that Ronald Reagan was important. I would hear God's name in other contexts in our home, but I would always hear Ronald Reagan's name. And in my opinion, California hasn't had that much of a decent governor since Ronald Reagan. Now, that's kind of a harsh criticism, I know, but I don't care about your party affiliation. Democrat, Republican alike have very much failed us uh, since uh, Reagan has uh, departed us as governor and, of course, uh, from this from this world of ours, from this nation. And for, for the first time in my living history has an opportunity come to the citizens of California to vote for a man who loves the state of California so much that he moved here because he loved it. A man who is a businessman, successful in his own right, educated, hardworking, self-made man who believes in his time when he decided it's probably a good time to retire, decided, I can't let this state continue in the direction that it's going. And that means a lot to me today because in this modern uh, climate of getting involved in front of the public view, what person in their right mind would take it upon themselves to be exposed to ridicule, mock, and falsehoods? And yet John Cox believes that California is worth fighting for, and so do I. Friends and family to this church, give a warm welcome to John Cox. Thank you. 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 Can be seated. Welcome, John. Well, that's a great welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and Ronald Reagan was from Illinois, too. Oh, my goodness. Of course. Yeah. I completely forgot about that. You know, we own them out here, though. I know. I know. Yeah, we've got Reagan Freeway, Reagan Library, Reagan 
Reagan everything, right? Reagan schools. But uh, you guys, um, I'm going to ask John some uh, questions up front, and then we'll talk about some policy things, some, some uh, issues that are facing him, facing all of us. But as I said a moment ago, this is a rare opportunity. That's why John is here today. That's why, we, that's why we've asked him to come. Uh, he doesn't need to hear this, but it's one of the reasons why I and others are going up and down the state of California speaking to pastors. It's a, it's a great opportunity where, as you know or do not know, as a church, uh, something's happened in the state of California when, when pastors are asking, even in some of the most remarkable demographics, they're asking this, this guy to come and speak to them uh, about how, to, how does a pastor encourage his church to vote a biblical worldview so I'm excited about what's going on, and I'm excited about you guys meeting John Cox today. And, and so here's what we're going to do. John, I'm just going to ask you straight up, and feel free to stand or to sit, whatever's more no, comfortable no. for you. Why in the world would you run for governor in a state where everybody is saying you can't break the stronghold that's on this state? It's impossible. The, it's just not going to... A lot of people have given up on California. A lot of people are moving out of California. Why are you taking this fight on? Well, you know, as you said, Jack, I, I love this state. Uh, I wake up every morning and kiss the ground. I mean, this is the most wonderful weather, the most wonderful natural, natural yeah. beauty. And, you know, California, unfortunately, has been taken over by uh, a bunch of special interest groups, a bunch of people, a political class in Sacramento that have led this state downward. And... Uh, it's affected the, the cost of living. It's affected our schools, uh, the very quality of our lives, the ability to buy a home, the ability to afford a decent lifestyle. Uh, we live in fear of water rationing and fires burning us out. Uh, and the political class just blames other people, but they don't look inward and see what they have failed to do in, in the management of the state. And... I just, uh, I, I moved out here, uh, you know, hoping to enjoy the wonderful California lifestyle, and I just couldn't sit by and watch this happen, and I needed to get involved, and, and that's why I'm doing this. You know, I love about, um, what I love about, this is, uh, this, is, this is something that is not foreign to his nature, though. Uh, from, from early on, John, tell us a little bit about your, your upbringing, and what I'm setting you up for is this. Your upbringing, when it comes to being personally responsible, from home life all yeah. the way through to your young life involvement in the community, tell us. Well, you know, my mom, a uh, very dominant personality, she, she had two master's degrees from Berkeley right here in California. My older brother, as a matter of fact, was born in San Jose. Uh, she got divorced and moved back to Chicago to be with her parents, which is where they were from. And uh, then she was date raped by my real father. And uh, she told me that later on, she obviously had me, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but my real father took one look at me and left, and uh, you know, I never saw him again, and he didn't take responsibility for me, and, and that's why I'm pro-life. Amen. Just pro-life. <laughs> you know... To me, you know, it's about my faith, but it's also about taking responsibility for what you do in life. And I address this to the men every bit as much as to the women. Uh, you know, a, a child is, a, a, is a, such a wonderful thing, and we need to take responsibility. And abortion is a way of avoiding responsibility, in my opinion. And, right. you know, I, I think that's true of, of men as well as women. Amen. That's excellent. You... Um Tell us about how that sense of responsibility, because growing up in a home where there's absence, which, by the way, my heart resonates with you because um, my biological father, uh, when found out that my mom was pregnant, mm -hmm. uh, he wound up going to Alaska and made it clear to her that when I come back, I'll be back in about a year, I want to make sure this baby's gone, that right. you take care of this baby. And so for me, interestingly enough, you live in San Diego, this was in San Diego for me, where, um, you know, she, she, she attempted an abortion. And it's funny because how things shape your life. Right. Because hearing that early on at teenage years, um, I didn't understand all that, but I just knew that life is sac very sacred Absolutely. and that God would have a stand for life. And so we really appreciate your, 
your well, you view. Know, it, and, and you mentioned the responsibility because, you know, if there's something that I really felt my whole life, it's, it's about taking responsibility. And I've done that in my community, in my church. Uh, and, you know, I think we, you know, it's not about a burden. Taking responsibility mm-hmm. isn't about a burden. It's about a self-affirming self-worth that, that helps you. When you take responsibility for others, you're not just helping the person that you're actually taking responsibility for, you're actually helping yourself. Mm-hmm. You're actually making yourself even more of a human being and enriching your own life by doing that. I, yeah, I really believe that. Absolutely true. <clears throat> John, on October uh, 31st, 1979, yeah. tell us what happened. Well, you know, I was, I was burning the candle at both ends. Uh, I had already worked my way through college. Uh, I always tell people I, I finished college in two and a half years because I was paying for it. <laughs> that would do it. Yeah. Uh, a couple of my daughters took five years because I was paying for it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I was, uh, I, I got a CPA, I was uh, an accountant, and I was working as a CPA during the day, and I, would, I went to law school at night. I always wanted to be a lawyer because one of my elementary school teachers told me I was good at arguing. Uh, <laughs> uh, my mom also told me that. Uh, and uh, I'm sitting on the train, I had pulled open my law books, and I'm studying feverishly because I had to study on the train. And a man sat down next to me, and, and he could see the bags under my eyes, and uh, kind of like they are now. And he, he started to talk to me about uh, my life, and I was telling him how tired I was. And he, he ministered to me and, and brought me to the Lord, and he gave me a Bible. And it was October 31st, 1979, and that was the day of my rebirth in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Love it. You went on from that influence in your life. The, um, I love the story about what, what your, or how your heart was moved in compassion toward those that were hurting, especially more specifically the elderly that you saw. Yeah, Tell yeah. us about what you did. You know, I was very involved in my church uh, when I was in Chicago. Uh, I uh, was president of the school board, the men's club, and all the other things that revolved around the church. And you know, we were talking one day, and we were talking about what we might do out in the community. And again, it's about living our faith and, and taking responsibility for our community. And we heard about this organization. It's now called Rebuilding Together. Uh, it was then, it was called Christmas in April. Uh, it's uh, until the uh, secularists got involved. Uh, now it's called Rebuilding Together. Oh. And it was started in Midland, Texas, by a a Sunday school uh, teacher who said the same thing. Why don't we go and take care of our community? Why don't we live out our faith? And to me, that's what, that's what, you know, uh, our faith teaches us. And so we formed a group, we recruited a board, and we started this charity in our community, and it repairs the homes of elderly, low-income, low-income elderly and disabled people who, let's face it, you know, they're living on Social Security or something, and they can't afford to mm-hmm. paint their house. They can't afford to fix things. They can't afford to, you know, do the, do the basic things for their home that we take for granted that we're able to do by, you know, ourselves or by hiring people. And so every year on the last Saturday in April, we get together. Uh, every year, we've had about 1,000 volunteers, and we've done about 50 homes. And so now... In these last 26 years or so, uh, we've repaired almost 1,500 homes with over 20,000 volunteers. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And I, and I go back every year and participate with all my friends back there. Uh, this year was the first year I missed it because of the campaign. It was right before the primary, and my consultants wouldn't let me leave California. <laughs> And uh, I'm going back next year. Sorry, I'll be the governor of California, but I'm still going to go back <laughs> and participate. It's excellent. So let me ask you some questions, and we'll kind of go through these, do the best we can. Our, um, our property values are being threatened. Some cities, they have, in fact, have been greatly impacted by this next issue. Uh, 
Crime is on the rise because of this. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm talking about border security. Yeah. We have got um, illegal aliens that have committed crimes, many of them having come across the border numerous times, criminals. And we've got a particular party that's now in power. They, they think it's okay. They think that this is some form of a uh, evolution of our new direction that it's just kind of the price we have to pay to accommodate. John, would you agree that we are 100% for legal immigration? Yeah, oh, absolutely. But illegal invasion of what's taking place is bringing a lot of bad people in and doing very, very bad things. Well, you know, Talk to us. Jack, a, a lot of people use, a lot of politicians use this as a way to divide us and get us angry and scared. I mean, I really don't believe they want to solve this problem. Unfortunately, we have this, you know, the, the country to the south of us is relatively not well governed. I mean, let's face it. I mean, uh, they had 26,000 murders last year. The, the drug war, the gangs, and all the money that flow out of the drug war pretty much runs rampant in, in Mexico, unfortunately. And it affects all the way down to Central and South America as well. And, you know, we don't have this problem, in, you know, to the neighbor to the north. We right. have it to the south. And... You know, the first rule of government is to protect us. I don't want these gangs operating here. Uh, so this, this whole idea of a sanctuary state, I think, is an absolute disgrace to the idea yes. that we want to protect people in this state. We want to make sure our law enforcement gets a criminal element out so that we can live our lives in peace and security. Yeah, amen. Church, listen, this is important. This is important because... Um, you have to now make it personal. You might say, well, I don't know if I liked John's answer. Well, wait a minute. How about you? Would you go buy a home in a sanctuary city right now? Would you go decide if you're going to move? No, not only will you not do that, but people are bailing out of San Francisco and Los Angeles for that very reason. Businesses in San Francisco under the leadership, previous leadership of Gavin Newsom, who's John's opponent, Property values, businesses have been leaving San Francisco. The streets are famously now filthy with human waste and needles from drug users. In fact, what about needles? What, about, what are they talking about doing? Well, you know, the homelessness in San Francisco was really such a tragedy, and really it's affected many states. I mean, you can see it here even in Riverside, you know, and in, in San Bernardino, in my home city of San Diego, we had a hepatitis A breakout. People died. Uh, and, and it's a real health hazard as well as a crime hazard. And the answer that they have in San Francisco apparently is to give people clean needles. They banned straws, thankfully. Oh, <laughs> because no straws. God knows that straws are a human health hazard, but... Uh, they're okay with hypodermic needles, and, uh, and now they want to do safe injection centers. And, you know, uh, I don't know about you, but if my own children were addicted to heroin, I think the last thing I would do would give them a safe room to shoot up in. Uh, I would get them cured. I would get them help. I mean, that's what a compassionate society does. <clears throat> Wow. Let's talk about, uh, and this is sensitive, this is a sensitive thing for us. I, I shouldn't say sensitive, passionate. Uh, religious freedom, specifically in California, has really been under attack, uh, m quite possibly more than any other state in the union right now. Uh, for example, this issue, state, the state of California mandating upon us uh, certain things that have robbed parental authority. Right. We believe that parental authority is a religious issue. The Bible's very clear about the parents having authority over the children. State of California, and I, I, let me quote something here a moment ago or, that I read a little while ago. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, parents are becoming increasingly concerned about the loss of their uh, right to educate their own children. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said in 2005, quote, there is no fundamental right of parent, parents to be the exclusive provider of information regarding sexual matters to their children, close quote. And the court also insisted that parents, quote, their parents' rights do not extend beyond the threshold of the school door, close quote. That's the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. 
Um, we've, we yeah. take, as, as, as uh, faith-based people in the state of California, we've been assaulted by our state government regarding freedoms. Uh, this state has told us and every church in California that, that regardless of the Hobby Lobby case that was won in the U.S. Supreme Court, churches in California will pay for elective abortions. And we have failed to comply with that mandate by the governor's office. We're currently in a lawsuit uh, with the state of California on this. Uh, we're glad that it's, I've been told that we'll go to the Supreme Court, especially in light of yesterday's change. I'm very happy about that. Yeah. So my point, yeah. my point is, John, what role does the state of California have over religious freedoms? Well, you know, one of my favorite expressions, Jack, is that you will be made to care. And that's what the state legislature and the public officials, the Ninth Circuit, are doing with parents. Uh, I believe, as you do, that parents have dominion over their children. Uh, that's right. Amen. I mean, who's going to care? Who is really going to care for your children more than you as a parent? I mean, nobody. Uh, no. And the reason that this has infiltrated our public schools is, is all about money and values. Uh, you know, so, somebody asked Willie Sutton why he robbed banks, and uh, he was a famous bank robber. Uh, and he said, really? Uh, that's where the money is. <laughs> and, and that's why the politicians want to run the schools and want to run our lives, because that's where the money is. Yep. And it's all about power and control. And if they can, you know, in, inculcate, in, if they can inject their mm -hmm. values into the schools, that's one more element of power and control. And I want parents to have control and power over their children. Amen. <laughs> Not the politicians. This is a tough one. California has always been, uh, in its history, uh, the very trendsetter in all kinds of things. Not only from fashion, the Hollywood scene, uh, movie production, uh, music and all of that stuff, but uh, going way back, I'm talking way back from Father Sarah's day, yes, but uh, by the way, remember this, there's no other state in the United States that has 21 missions that were established yeah. to preach the gospel, no other state, yeah. but having said that, there's no other state in the nation that had a gold rush like California, there's no other state that has created and established the aviation and space technology industry Absolutely. but California, California the computer was born in California. Think about that. Silicon Valley, the technology is still continuing to be born here. California had the greatest public transportation highways in the world at one point. Yep. California. California, known. What is California known for also? The, the, bread, the sa salad bowl of the nation. Salad bowl. California exported more food out to the nation and the world than any other state. California, on and on it goes. We have sunk from being the fifth or sixth largest economy among nations on the earth, and we're sinking. And one of those things is that we were the bastion of education for great high-level ed education. We, we throw now more money at our education system than I think than any other state. Maybe, maybe, there's, maybe Maine or Massachusetts is higher than us. Uh, we spend more money to educate one child, and yet the data shows that that result is the opposite. Let me read this to you. California schools consistently rank among the worst in the nation. 29.2% of fourth graders in the state of California are prof proficient in math. 27.8% are proficient in reading, and less than 30% of fourth graders in California are proficient in either both math and reading. John, what's your solution for California's low performance in our education system? Well, you know, teaching, my mom was a school teacher. Uh, she cared about what she did, and, you know, she didn't care for the fact that there might be teachers that didn't perform that well. I mean, there, unfortunately, some people just aren't cut out for teaching. And unfortunately, the system that's developed here just protects uh, those, those teachers and makes it so it's impossible to fire uh, or, or reallocate or reassign a, a teacher. Uh, I want teachers paid like rock stars and baseball players. Yeah, sure. I want... I want teachers to be treated like the professionals they truly are. 
and not to be just protected at all costs. Yes. Uh, I'd love for there to be a bidding war for good teachers. Wouldn't that be great? Yes, wouldn't that would we know be great. That, wouldn't we know that our children are getting the right education? Yes. You know, one statistic, Jack, is that fully half of our public school children today aren't reading to grade level in our California schools. And my mom was a librarian. She taught reading, and she instilled in my brothers and I the absolute need to be able to read. I mean, that's the bedrock mm -hmm. of our education. And the idea that half of our school children aren't able to read to grade level means that we're going to be populating our prisons a lot more than they should be, that's for sure. That's right. Horace Greeley said, go west, young man, go west. Because there was opportunity out west. And we've all been affected by friends and family that have said, I'm leaving, I'm leaving California. Some have said, I'm leaving California because it's nuts. It's not what it used to be. I understand that. Some of you or some of them had to leave because their businesses like Toyota in Los Angeles up yeah. and left us and took thousands and thousands of jobs, as you all know. This is continuing to escalate. It's a sad thing that a state so great, that a state that, is, as you said earlier, has been so blessed with natural beauty and the ability to do amazing things. John... Why would somebody that's here right now or somebody that's watching, they're on the fence. They're thinking, well, you know what? I mean, I've, you know, I, maybe I should just keep voting the party line or maybe I don't know. John, tell them, why should they vote for you regarding what's, what the crisis of California is from housing to well, jobs not being able to make it here anymore? The message of our campaign is that help is on the way. And, and that's truly the, the case because... You know, most people are working. I mean, uh, thank God, you know, uh, we've gotten a great economy now. Uh, we're actually achieving levels of growth that we haven't seen in a decade uh, around the country. And so most Californians are employed, but they're finding that they can't afford a truly decent lifestyle in the state. Uh, the cost of gasoline, the cost, you know, it's, it's over $4 a gallon. And I'm telling you right now, it's heading to five before you know it. Uh, and the cost of housing. I build apartments for a living. I got into the uh, real estate business uh, 30 years ago, and I build apartments in other states for a good one-fourth of what it costs to build in California. That's ridiculous. And the price of lumber isn't more in those other, or isn't less in those other states. The price of appliances and windows and roofing and bricks, they're not much less in those other states. You know what's different in those other states is government. That's right. California, with the lawsuits, the taxes, the delays, the mandates, have driven up the cost of housing to where people just can't afford to live. Uh, I toured the Sriracha plant in Los Angeles as part of my bus tour that we just got done. Uh, I'm sure you all like Sriracha. Yeah, amen. I, I had Sriracha ice cream. <laughs> And it had a kick to it, I want to tell you right now. <laughs> and I'm listening to one of the workers there, uh, Philippe, and he was telling me he has to drive 40 minutes to get to work. That's the first thing. You all can identify with that, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And he's burning four-hour a gallon gasoline to do it. And then on top of that, he's living in a one-bedroom apartment with himself and four children. Mm. And he's paying $1,500 a month for this one-bedroom apartment. Yep. And I thought, I said to him, I said, that is a tough lifestyle. Why don't you leave California? And he said, what? And leave my Dodgers? <laughs> I grew up a White Sox fan, so it's tough for me, although... Uh, Sandy Koufax was my hero when I was okay. growing up. Okay, all right. That's but, good. Uh, but, you know, that's what's, that's, that's what's happening to this, you know, to this state. People are just being driven out. The, the cost of housing, the water cost, the electricity, I mean, air conditioning. They tell us, well, it, 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 if, you're, if you're sad about your electricity bill, then just don't run your air Turn conditioner. Really? That's what you want us to do? We live in this wonderful environment, but it gets hot here some days. 
and you want us not to, you know, they're telling you, by the way, that you're going to have to live with water rationing in a few years. Did you oh, know that? Did tell them. I'm not sure if they're aware of Brown's edict about the 55 gallon. Do you guys 55 know 55 gallons Do you know is this? all you're going to have. Did California is going to be renamed Smelly California. Because you're not going to be able to take a bath in this state in a few years. Brown is promoting you showering every other day, like he does. Oh, now let's not get personal, Jack. I mean, you know. Have you met Jerry Brown? I'm kidding. No, I. I thankfully, I haven't met him yet. No. Here's the here's the thing about water. John and I share. John and I share something about water. We've watched Israel become yes. the first water-independent nation on earth. Yes. And they're, listen, they're pulling water from the Mediterranean. Okay, the Mediterranean. Okay, we have the Pacific. And listen, John, can I make up this policy for you right now? Okay. You guys, if, the, if global warming's true and the caps are melting, then the seas are rising. If you're concerned about the seas rising, then have Governor John Cox build desalinization plants to pull water from the ocean and, and water California. This state is known for its technology achievements. We've got the brain power. We've got Caltech. We've got Stanford. They can pull it off. Listen, we could drain water from the Pacific without any environmental impact. In fact, it would help the caps, the melting caps, and we can turn California anywhere we want into an oasis. How's that? You know, listen, I, I think it's a great idea. And, you know, let's, let's also recycle. Let's, yes. let's make sure that we keep our valuable water, but we also need to build reservoirs in the north, especially where we have snow yes. melt and everything. Yes. I mean, you know, listen, we love this state. It's grown wonderfully. We want our children to stay here. We want the state to be available for our children. We certainly, I don't feel it's my place to tell people not to have children. Uh, that's God's bounty to us, mm -hmm. and we should make sure that everybody has the ability and the freedom to be able to have children. And in order to do that, we're going to need to provide for water and for electricity and for all the comforts and the wonderful things that, that we've been able to generate for ourselves. John, um, I don't know why, maybe somebody does, maybe you know why. It's, the uh, San Onofre nuclear power plant has been decommissioned now. Yeah. It's going offline. Yeah. Um, I forget how old it is, but I remember growing up as a kid driving up the five freeway seeing that thing. But there was never... It was a great source of power. Uh, we, had, we didn't have any uh, dangers with it. Why, in your opinion, is California not building more of those types of fantastic, I don't proven know industries? Exactly. I mean, I've, obviously, I'm worried about a uh, nuclear reactor sitting on an active fault. Sure, of course. Uh, and frankly, you know, right next to the ocean may not be the best place either. You know, I mean, but a, a lot of countries of the world, France, for France. one, generates most of their electricity from nuclear sources. It's the cleanest en energy. It doesn't produce any pollutants, right. although, you know, there is a waste problem, and, you know, they re-enrich it down to a small amount, and, you know, they're able to deal with that. Uh, you know, listen, I, I believe we've got all these great sources. We need to explore yeah. all of them, and I want to make sure our environment is preserved. I want to make sure that we don't unleash Absolutely. nuclear terrors around uh, the state. I'm, I'm as concerned with that as everybody, but... I think we can do it wisely and effectively and intelligently. And, you know, the trouble is that political leaders sometimes get people scared because that's how yes. they operate. I mean, that's what gets people interested. And, and, you know, let's just look at what we can do in terms of best practices and providing for our best, uh, our, our best electricity. Very good. We're almost done, you guys. Um, you touched on it a moment ago. We don't usually get into propositions here unless they threaten us in a biblical sense. There's so many of them. Yeah. Uh, for us, it started with Prop 8 way back when, which threatened, of course, Proposition 22 that preceded it. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of talk going on right now. In fact, I, had to, I happened to have been in Sacramento on the day I watched uh, uh, the gentleman who was the creator of the gas tax, uh, Josh Newman. I saw the day that he was being evicted from... Wow. The state capitol, he, he was moving his stuff out because there was a, uh, a recall on him right. for, for this reason. Right. Right. Proposition 6, you talked about gas tax. 
Proposition 6 is going to appear on your ballot statewide, everybody. And um, what, do you think it's going to... By the way, I think if I have this... Have this it's yes on 6. Yes. Okay? Yes on 6. I do not want gas tax. Okay? Yeah, it's kind so, of a negative thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Tell us well, about Well, you know, uh, first of all, the fact is that California spends a lot of money on its roads, but... The, uh, the agency that's responsible, Caltrans, has been analyzed and analyzed, and it actually is one of the worst managed uh, operations in the, in the, in the country. Uh, it's been documented that it spends twice what Texas spends, for example, on building or maintaining a mile of road. Now, part of that is the fact that our roads are wider, but part of it is the fact that we have all the environmental regulations and mandates, which, by the way, they waive when it comes to sports stadiums that are owned by a lot of wealthy people, but you know, they don't waive them for others or for housing, which is a whole other area. But you know, we have to you know, pay taxes. We don't like to pay taxes. Uh, you put up a slide of the, the Stamp Act, which our founders rebelled against the king on, uh, which was a minor tax compared <laughs> to what we pay. But we don't mind paying taxes as long as our public officials use that money wisely and efficiently. And that's not what they're doing with, with our roads. They're spending way more money than they need to. And, and instead of reforming Caltrans, they went and passed this gas tax. And that's why I am the leader of the effort to repeal it, because they, they don't really use our money wisely or efficiently. That's and that's right. going to end. Thank you, John. Yes. And let me tell you, you know, this, this proposition system is a uh, legacy. Uh, Hiram Johnson, uh, you know, who ran, I think, with Vice President, uh, you know, and Teddy Roosevelt ran. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to be able to petition and change our government. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's been distorted now where a lot of interest groups are using it to get things done that they couldn't get done in the legislature. But as you know, Jack, one of my main things that I want to do as the governor of this state is I want to change our legislature. Yes. Right now, it represents these interest groups. I want a legislature that represents us. Yes, please. Yes. Represents us, truly. Well, listen to what he's saying. He needs a legislature that's, that's workable. That, that's where you come in. You've got to vote on November 6th. You've got to get the right people in office and to give John the ability in Sacramento to get these things done. And so uh, some have said, I happen to agree, some have said that California has hit rock bottom. And that may or may not be true, but I can tell you this, there's a stirring that's taking place. Something's going on. It's, up in, it's going on up and down the state. And I, I can't imagine another candidate coming along in the near future that shares the same worldview values that you have. A man of faith and a man worth praying for. We're going to pray right now together. But we live in a republic, ladies and gentlemen, and because of neglect, under all of our watch, we have let others send the wrong people to Sacramento. And the Bible says in Proverbs 29, verse 2, that when the righteous are in power, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. And California is groaning. It's not just us. There are many others waking up to the fact that California is groaning. And I love what John said. Hope is on the way. Listen, we all know this as believers Salvation is not going to arrive on Air Force One no. or Sacramento. Salvation is in Jesus. That's settled. Amen. But God has given us, according to his word, the governments of the nations. We have the kind of government that we will allow. We have allowed a great government in California to run amok and to run a mess because we have been too busy it's no longer, I don't believe it's apathy anymore. I believe it's more of a willful neglect problem. It's time now for all of us to register to vote and make sure that you vote 
on Tuesday, November 6th. We're going to pray for John right now together. Father, we just thank you for our brother God who has taken this mantle up to stand. Father, for what's right. Though he may be, and we thank you for it, an outsider when it comes to Sacramento. He's not a politician. He's one of us. He's a businessman. He knows how to work and work hard. But Lord, up there in Sacramento, you can feel You can feel a tangible presence in that place. We're asking you, Lord, that you would remember what our founders of this state wrote down in that preamble, that we present this constitution to you, God, that we might be a governed people by Almighty God. So, Lord, we're asking you that we as a people would be pricked in our hearts to bring California back. Not by revolution, not by gun, not by riot, but by voting. May we exercise our freedom that has been blood-bought, a freedom and a liberty that is a great responsibility. We ask you to watch over John, his wife Sarah, and his kids as we commend them into your hands. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. 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 Thank you, amen. John. Thank you, Jack. Definitely. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.